Professor's shocking statement, China's language education is a deadly money-making plot. Rare vampire disease strikes woman in Zhejiang, severe abdominal pain and black liquid expectorated. Li Chang doesn't dare to steal the spotlight? She's set to meet foreign CEOs. Hong Kong media draws parallels between past and present, CCP internal strife nearing climactic showdown. It's all covered in today's China Truths. <laughs> Professor's shocking statement, China's language education is a deadly money-making plot. A video that has been making rounds on Platform X features Professor Bao Peng Shan from Shanghai Open University lambasting the state of Chinese language education as a ploy for financial gain and lethal harm. It is speculated that this video would have been swiftly censored within China. In detail, Professor Bao draws comparisons between the textbooks used by his son and those from his father's era. Today's elementary language books are filled with tales of little chicks, white rabbits, big watermelons, and sesame seeds, associating with animals rather than imparting cultural knowledge. In contrast, his father, who had barely more than two years of education in a private school, lived as a person of culture throughout his life. Beginning with classics such as the Confucian Analects and the Thousand Character Classic. He was profoundly moved by the couplet at the Guanin Temple his father had erected, a temple so small, sans monks, the wind does sweep, so high the sky, before Buddha, a lamp does keep. Professor Bao remarks that after a dozen years of schooling, students hardly retain any articles of substance in their minds. What then is the purpose of current educational practices? Nothing short of a deadly, money-grubbing scheme. Several netizens voiced their strong concurrence with Professor Bao's assessment, condemning the CCP's educational system as leading youth astray and catastrophizing the nation, stating that, beyond merely exploiting for money and inflicting harm, the CCP's substandard so-called education fundamentally seeks to dull the masses' intellect in a manner both profoundly insidious and covert, ostensibly tailored to fit children's developmental stages and cognitive capabilities, packaging learning as entertaining. Yet, devoid of any genuine educational content, it leaves minds empty, making ample room for indoctrination with party ideology, narratives of animosity, and party loyalty. The Communist Party embodies deceit, malevolence, hypocrisy, and cruelty at their worst. The consequences of an education of dregs is to merely produce generations devoid of morality and intellect. Some said that the subjects most in need of abolition are politics and Marxism-Leninism. However, some netizens offered a different stance, pondering does rote learning of the four books and five classics lead to inventing a smartphone? Which Nobel laureate in physics was raised on the Analects? Republic of China primary school textbooks, a timeless demon-revealing mirror. Commentators have hailed Republic of China era primary school textbooks as timeless beacons of truth, showcasing humanity, freedom, and elegance, sharp contrasts to the utilitarianism, repression, ugliness, and crudeness found in today's toxic textbooks. These textbooks aim to nurture from an early age citizens who were aware, morally upright, proactive, and tasteful, setting the cornerstone for the nation's wealth and the ethnic group's revival. According to the era's lexicon, the goal was to establish the foundations of general knowledge, aesthetic sense, ethics, personal character, manners, traditional values, and ultimately, the spirit of the nation. Lately, there's been a resurgence of interest among parents in mainland China for these Republic of China period textbooks, with Shanghai's publishing sector reissuing classics like the Enlightenment Mandarin textbook which sold out rapidly and garnered overwhelmingly positive reviews online. This indicates that these age-old textbooks retain their relevance and vitality nearly a hundred years on. In stark contrast, there's uncertainty about who the masters behind the current primary school Chinese textbooks are. The internet has unveiled that the People's Education Press's elementary school mathematics textbooks feature distorted and grotesque characters, riddled with tattoos, erotic imagery, and sleazy perversions, leading to widespread parental outrage and concern. 
Moreover, many publishers have been outed for circulating toxic textbooks and dark materials detrimental to the young's physical and mental well-being. Indeed, the CCP has long exploited educational materials to indoctrinate and corrupt the youth. For decades, textbooks for Chinese language, history, and political education in elementary and secondary schools have been brimming with narratives that push red propaganda, distorting history and glorifying fictitious heroes, all aimed at molding minds from a tender age. These efforts paint the CCP's tarnished history in a favorable light, indoctrinate unwavering loyalty, and extol the party's virtues. Nonetheless, the CCP maintains its own educational system, from kindergartens to high schools, setting its sights on sending these children overseas for advanced studies. They enjoy exclusive benefits in everything from their diet to their education. The CCP stands accused as the chief architect behind the majority of today's global calamities. Rare vampire disease strikes woman in Zhejiang, severe abdominal pain and black liquid expectorated. In Zhejiang province's Jinhua city, a young woman struggled with severe bouts of abdominal pain and vomited a black substance, leading doctors to diagnose her with the rare vampire disease. Hangzhou TV detailed how Xiao Ting, a pseudonym for a woman from Jinhua City, struggled with intense abdominal pain during her menstrual cycles for over a year, initially dismissing it as severe menstrual cramps. Despite seeking help from numerous hospitals and undergoing extensive testing, her condition remained undiagnosed and unchanged, leaving her in unbearable pain. Recently, the pain returned, lasting four days without relief, and was accompanied by fever and chest tightness, yet all her medical tests came back normal. She was sent home without any medication. The situation escalated the next day when shouting vomited black liquid, prompting an emergency visit to Hangzhou's First People's Hospital. There, after a thorough evaluation, doctors suspected she had acute intermittent porphyria. Upon doctor's advice, Xiaoting exposed her urine to sunlight, which turned a soy sauce color in less than half an hour, confirming a diagnosis of porphyria, a rare condition affecting 1 in 50,000 people. After receiving the correct treatment, Xiaoting's symptoms improved, and her abdominal pain disappeared. Doctors explained that porphyria, also called porphyrin disease and nicknamed vampire disease due to the light sensitivity it induces, is caused by a deficiency or reduced activity of enzymes needed for hemoglobin synthesis. This blockage leads to a porphyrin metabolism disorder. They also noted that the condition often manifests as severe abdominal pain around menstruation, leading to frequent misdiagnosis. However, a simple diagnostic test, exposing urine to sunlight to see if it darkens, can reliably identify porphyria. Li Chang doesn't dare to steal the spotlight? She's set to meet foreign CEOs. The annual China Development Forum wrapped up last weekend and in line with media predictions, abandoned its traditional private meetings between the prime minister and foreign CEOs. However, rumors suggest Xi Jinping may meet with foreign CEOs post-forum, potentially setting a new precedent. At the Beijing Forum, high-profile attendees included Apple CEO Tim Cook and executives from global giants like McKinsey and Qualcomm. Premier Li Chang, in his keynote, balanced praising China's economy's long-term positive prospects with acknowledgments of growing real estate and local debt risks. Li Chang, the Communist Party's second-in-command and the most senior leader to keynote in recent years, reflects the CCP's keen interest in wooing foreign investment. However, Li's unexpected cancellation of the final day's CEO discussions, a staple for 23 years, left many questioning. Commenting on this issue, Lai Rongwei, CEO of the Taiwan Inspirational Association, observed that these moves hint at diminishing roles for the Premier and the State Council, troubling for foreign investors seeking stability. Lai elaborated on China's challenges, economic downturn, concentrated political power, and restricted speech, causing mixed signals for foreign investors amidst regulatory changes, undermining investor confidence. Despite some CEOs' early departure last Sunday night, the Wall Street Journal reported Xi Jinping's planned meetings with U.S. business leaders, a continuation from a San Francisco dinner last November, though last-minute cancellations remain a possibility. 
Associate Professor Feng Chongyi from the University of Technology, Sydney said that he saw a potential for a new norm where Xi Jinping seizes the spotlight when possible. If reluctant for any reason, others like Li Chang won't dare to step in. However, Xi Jinping, lacking in virtue and ability, prefers to feel out the situation first with preliminary signals. If things are favorable, he's all for grabbing the spotlight. But when faced with tough questions beyond his capability, he opts out. At a dinner in November last year, Xi Jinping tried to reassure American investors amidst a dramatic 82% drop in foreign direct investment in China, the lowest in three decades. Despite his efforts, the decline continued into January and February of this year, with a 19.9% year-on-year fall, marking an eighth month of continuous downturn. This year, Xi Jinping unveiled the new Quality Productivity Initiative echoed by Li Chang at the China Development Forum's opening, promising to speed up the development of new quality productivity. Whether this initiative will lure foreign investors is yet to be seen. Hong Kong media draws parallels between past and present, CCP internal strife nearing climactic showdown. A film review by HK01, a Hong Kong media outlet, seen as drawing parallels between historical and current events, is interpreted as hinting at internal power conflicts within Zhongnanhai approaching a critical juncture. In detail, HK01's recent article on the Dynasty of Ming 1566, a Chinese television series that aired in 2007, delves into the dynamics of various power struggles. The title clearly labels it as the long battle between two forces, highlighting conflicts both between the elite and the common people, and within the bureaucracy itself. Apollo Network's detailed analysis suggests the article subtly references the CCP. The piece discusses the rivalry between the bureaucratic Qinglu faction and the Yen party, citing Qingliu's Zhang Zhuzhang's advice to let Zhejiang descend into chaos as a sacrifice for victory over the Yen party. HK01 implies that for the Qinglu faction, the chaos is justified if it leads to their rival's defeat. Apollo Network views this as a direct critique of CCP leadership, suggesting that Xi Jinping's anti-corruption efforts are more about overpowering opponents than genuine reform, all while maintaining a facade of being high-sounding. Moreover, HK01 references a dialogue between Chen Duxiu, the CCP's former general secretary, and his son, implying that today's reformists may become tomorrow's conservatives. This ongoing struggle reflects how shifting circumstances can invert perceptions of progress and conservatism within the CCP, indicating a significant ideological reversal. HK01 cites Chinese historian Qian Mu, stating, We erroneously believed that all previous political traditions needed to be discarded, and so they were. In doing so, we also relinquished our shared reverence and trust in all traditions and habits. But how can we establish central authority? It becomes challenging if we fail to offer something that earns universal respect and belief across the nation. Apollo Network draws parallels between this and Xi Jinping's 2013 address, in which he questioned, why did the Soviet Union fall apart? Why did the Soviet Communist Party collapse? A significant factor was the fierce ideological battle, rejecting Lenin, rejecting Stalin, leading to disarray in thought, and ultimately, the vast Soviet Communist Party disintegrated. The implication from Hong Kong media is a warning to Xi Jinping, tapping into his deepest fear of the party's dissolution, hinting that excessive repudiation of the past could lead to the CCP's downfall. Apollo's commentary suggests that the article's political implications are unmistakable, appearing to depict the conflict between two forces within the CCP as approaching a critical juncture. Let us know your thoughts on today's topic by leaving a comment below. If you found this video helpful, please share it with a friend, it inspires us to continue creating more quality and reliable content. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more interesting insights from China Truths. Thanks for tuning in.